Chapter 1. Don't confuse me with facts. Most of us have had the experience, either as parents or youngsters, of trying to discover the hidden picture within another picture in a children's magazine. Usually you are shown a landscape with trees, bushes, flowers, and other bits of nature. The caption reads something like this. Concealed somewhere in this picture is a donkey pulling a cart with a boy in it. Can you find them? Try as you might, usually you could not find the hidden picture until you turned to a page farther back in the magazine which would reveal how cleverly the artist had hidden it from us. If we study the landscape, we realize that the whole picture was painted in such a way as to conceal the real picture within. And once we see the real picture, it stands out like the proverbial painful digit. We believe the picture painters of the mass media are artfully creating landscapes for us which deliberately hide the real picture. In this book, we will show you how to discover the hidden picture in the landscapes presented to us daily through newspapers, radio, and television. Once you can see through the camouflage, you will see the donkey, the cart, and the boy who have been there all along. Millions of Americans are concerned and frustrated over mishappenings in our nation. They feel that something is wrong, drastically wrong. But because of the picture, painters can't quite put their fingers on it. Maybe you are one of those persons. Something is bugging you, but you aren't sure what. We keep electing new presidents who seemingly promise faithfully to halt the worldwide communist advance, put the blocks to extravagant government spending, douse the fires of inflation, put the economy on, its, on an even keel, reverse the trend which is turning the country into a moral sewer, and toss the criminals into the, the who's gal where they belong. Yet despite high hopes and glittering campaign promises, these problems continue to worsen no matter who is in office. Each new administration, whether it be Republican or Democrat, continues the same basic policies of the previous administration, which had so thoroughly denounced during the election campaign. It is considered poor form to mention this, but it is true nonetheless. Is there a plausible reason to explain why this happens? We are not supposed to think so. We are supposed to think it is all accidental and coincidental, and that, therefore, there is nothing we can do about it. FDR once said, In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. He was in a good position to know. We believe that many of the major world events that are shaping our destinies occur because somebody or somebodies have planned them that way. If we were merely dealing with the law of averages, half of the events affecting our nation's well-being should be good for America. If we were dealing with mere incompetence, our leaders should occasionally make a mistake in our favor. We should attempt to prove that we are not really dealing with coincidence or stupidity, but with planning and brilliance. This small book deals with that planning and brilliance and how it has helped shape the foreign and domestic policies of the last six administrations. We hope it will explain matters which have up to now seemed inexplicable, that it will bring into sharp focus images which have been obscured by the landscape painters of the mass media. Those who believe that major world events result from planning are laughed at for believing in the conspiracy theory of history. Of course, no one in this modern day and age really believes in the conspiracy theory of history, except those who have taken the time to study the subject. When you think about it, there are only two theories of history. Either things happen by accident, neither planned nor caused by anybody, or they happen because they are planned and somebody causes them to happen. In reality, it is the accidental theory of history, preached in the unhallowed halls of ivy, which should be ridiculed. Otherwise, why does every recent administration make the same mistakes as the previous ones? Why do they repeat the errors of the past which produce inflation, depressions, and war? Why does our State Department stumble from one communist-aiding blunder to another? If you believe it is all an accident or the result of mysterious and unexplainable tides of history, you'll be regarded as an intellectual who understands that we live in a complex world. If you believe that some, something like 32,496 consecutive coincidences over the past 40 years stretches the law of averages a bit, you are a kook. Why is it that virtually all reputable scholars and mass media columnists and commentators reject the cause and effect or conspiratorial theory of history? Primarily, most scholars follow the crowd in the academic world just as most women follow fashions. To buck the tide means social and professional ostracism. The same is true of the mass media. 
While professors and pontificators profess to be tolerant and broad-minded, in practice it's strictly a one-way street with all traffic flowing left. A mayoist can be tolerated by liberals of ivory towerland or by the establishment's media pundits, but to be a conservative and a conservative who propounds a conspiratorial view is absolutely verboten. Better you should be a drunk at a national WCTU convention. Secondly, these people have over the years acquired a strong vested emotional interest in their own errors. Their intellects and egos are totally committed to the accidental theory. Most people are highly reluctant to admit that they have been conned or have shown poor judgment. To inspect the evidence of the existence of a conspiracy guiding our political destiny from behind the scenes would force many of these people to repudiate a lifetime of accumulated opinions. It takes a person with strong character indeed to face the facts and admit he has been wrong even if it was because he was uninformed. Such was the case with the author of this book. It was only because he set out to prove the conservative anti-communists wrong that he happened to end up writing this book. His initial reaction to the conservative point of view was one of suspicion and hostility, and it was only after many months of intensive research that he had to admit that he had been conned. Politicians and intellectuals are attracted by the concept that events are propelled by some mysterious tide of history or happen by accident. By this reasoning, they hope to escape the blame when things go wrong. Most intellectuals, pseudo and otherwise, deal with the conspiratorial theory of history simply by ignoring it. They never attempt to refute the evidence. It can't be refuted. If and when the silent treatment doesn't work, these objective scholars and mass media opinion molders resort to personal attacks, ridicule, and satire. The personal attacks tend to divert attention from the facts which an author or speaker is trying to expose. The idea is to force the person exposing the conspiracy to stop the exposure and spend his time and effort defending himself. However, the most effective weapons used against the conspiratorial theory of history are ridicule and satire. These extremely potent weapons can be cleverly used to avoid any honest attempt at refuting the facts. After all, nobody likes to be made fun of. Rather than be ridiculed, most people will keep quiet and, the subject certainly does lend itself to ridicule and satire, Mo one technique which can be used is to expand the conspiracy to the extent it becomes absurd. For instance, one man from the halls of Poison Ivy might say in a scoffingly arrogant tone, I suppose you believe every liberal professor gets a telegram each morning from conspiracy headquarters containing his orders for the day's brainwashing of his students. Some conspiratorialists do indeed overdraw the picture by expanding the conspiracy from the small clique which it is to include every local knee-jerk liberal activist and the government bureaucrat. Or, because of racial or religious bigotry, they will take small fragments of legitimate evidence and expand them into a conclusion that will support this particular prejudice, i.e., the conspiracy is totally Jewish, Catholic, or Masonic. These people do not help to expose the conspiracy, but sadly play into the hands of those who want the public to believe that all conspiratorialists are screwballs. Intellectuals are fond of mouthing cliches like, the conspiracy theory is often tempting. However, it is overly simplistic. To ascribe absolutely everything that happens to the machinations of a small group of power-hungry conspirators is overly simplistic. But in our opinion, nothing is more simplistic than doggedly holding onto it at the accidental view of major world events. In most cases, liberals simply accuse all those who discuss the conspiracy of being paranoid. Ah, you right-wingers, they say, rustling every bush, kicking over every rock, looking for imaginary boogeymen. Then comes the coup de grace, labeling the conspiratorial theory as the devil theory of history. Liberals love that one, even though it is an empty phrase, it sounds so sophisticated. With the leaders of the academic and communications world as assuming the sneering attitude towards the conspiratorial or cause and effect theory of history, it is not surprising that millions of innocent and well-meaning people, the natural desire not to appear naive, assume the attitudes and repeat the clichés of the opinion makers. These persons, in their attempt to appear sophisticated, assume their mentors air a smug superiority, even though they themselves have not spent five minutes in study on the subject of international conspiracy. The accidentalists would have us believe that ascribing any of our problems to planning is simplistic, 
and all our problems are caused by poverty, ignorance, and disease. Hereafter, here and after abbreviated as PID. They ignore the fact that organized conspirators use PID, real and imagined, as an excuse to build a jail for us all. Most of the world has been in PID since time immemorial, and it takes incredibly superficial thinking to describe the ricocheting of the United States government from one disaster to another over the past 30 years to PID. Accidentalists ignore the fact that some of the more advanced nations in the world have been captured by communists. Czechoslovakia was one of the world's most modern industrial nations, and Cuba had the second highest per capita income of any nation in Central and South America. It is not true, however, to state that there are no members of the intellectual elite who subscribe to the conspiratorial theory of history. For example, there is Professor Carol Quigley of the Foreign Service School at Georgetown University. Professor Quigley can hardly be accused of being a right-wing extremist. Those three words have been made inseparable by the mass media. Dr. Quigley has all the liberal credentials, having taught at the liberal establishment's academic meccas of Princeton and Harvard. In his 1,300-page, 8-pound tome, Tragedy and Hope, Dr. Quigley reveals the existence of the conspiratorial network, which will be discussed in this book. The professor is not merely formulating a theory, but revealing this network's existence from first-hand experience. He also makes it clear that it is only the network's secrecy and not their goals to which he objects. Professor Quigley discloses, I know the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years, and was permitted for years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims, and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments. I've objected both of the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown. I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. We agree. Its role in history does deserve to be known. That is why we have written this book. However, we both emphatically disagree with this network's aim, which the professor describes as nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political war system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In other words, this power-mad clique wants to control and rule the world. Even more frightening, they want total control over all individual actions. As Professor Quigley observes, his, the individual's freedom and choice, will be controlled from within very narrow alternatives by the fact that he will be numbered from birth and followed as a number through his educational training his required military or other public service, his tax contributions, his health and medical requirements, and his finest retirement, final retirement and death benefits. He wants control over all natural resources, business, banking, and transportation by controlling the governments of the world. In order to accomplish these aims, the conspirators have had no qualms about form fomenting wars, oppressions, and hatred. They want a monopoly which would eliminate all competitors and destroy the free enterprise system, and Professor Quigley of Harvard, Princeton, and Georgetown approves. Professor Quigley is not the only academic who is aware of the existence of a clique of surf-perpetuating conspirators, whom we shall call insiders. Other honest scholars finding the same individuals at the scenes of disastrous political fires over and over again have concluded that there is obviously an organization of pyromaniacs at work in the world, but these intellectually honest scholars realize that if they challenged the insiders head-on, their careers would be destroyed. The author knows these men exist because he has been in contact with some of them. There are also religious leaders who are aware of the existence of this conspiracy in a UPI story dated December 27, 1965. Father Pedro Elupe, head of the Jesuit order of the Roman Catholic Church, made the following charges during his remarks to the Ecumenical Council. This godless society operates in an extremely efficient manner, at least in its higher levels of leadership. It makes use of every possible means at its disposal, be they scientific, technical, social, or economic. It follows a perfectly mapped out strategy. It holds almost complete sway in international organizations and financial circles in the field of mass communications, press, cinema, radio, and television. There are a number of problems to be overcome in convincing a person of the problem 
of the possible existence of a conspiratorial clique of insiders who, from the very highest levels, manipulate government policy. In this case, truth is really stranger than fiction. We are dealing with history's greatest whodunit, a mystery th thriller that puts eerie Stanley Gardner to shame. If you love a mystery, you'll be fascinated with the study of the operations of the insiders. If you do study this network, of which Professor Quigley speaks, you'll find that which had at first seemed incredible not only exists, but heavily influences our lives. It must be remembered that the first job of any conspiracy, whether it be in politics, crime, or within a business office, is to convince everyone else that no conspiracy exists. The conspirators' success will be determined largely by their ability to do this. That the elite of the academic world and mass communications media always poo-poo the existence of the insiders merely serves to camouflage their operations. These artists hide the boy, the cart, and the donkey. Probably at some time you have been involved with or had personal knowledge of some event which was reported in the news. Perhaps it occurred and it concerned an athletic event, an election, a committee of your or your business. Did the report contain the real story? The story behind the story? Probably not, and for a variety of reasons. The reporter had time and space problems, and there is a good chance that the persons involved deliberately did not reveal all the facts. Possibly, the reporter's own prejudices govern what facts went into the story, and which were de deleted. Our point is that most people know from personal experience that a news story often is not the whole story, but many of us assume that our own case is unique when really it is typical. What is true about the reporting of local events is equally as true about the reporting of national and international events. Psychological problems are also involved in inducing people to look at the evidence concerning the insiders. People are usually comfortable with their old beliefs and conceptions. When Columbus told people the world was a ball and not a pancake, they were highly upset. They were being asked to reject their way of thinking of a lifetime and adopt a whole new outlook. The intellectuals of the day scoffed at Columbus, and people were afraid they would lose social prestige if they listened to him. Many others just did not want to believe the, er the world was round. It complicated too many things, and typical flat earthers had such a vested interest involving their own egos that they heaped abuse on Columbus for challenging their view of the universe. Don't confuse us with facts, our minds are made up, they said. Those same factors apply today. Because the establishment controls the media, anyone exposing the insiders will, will be the recipient of a continuous fusillade of invective from newspapers, magazines, TV, and radio. In this manner, one is threatened with loss of social respectability. If he dares broach the idea that there is organization behind any of the problems currently racking America, Unfortunately for many people, social status comes before intellectual honesty. Although they would never admit it, social position is more important to many, Ameri to many people than is the survival of freedom in America. If you ask these people which is more important, social respectability or saving their children from slavery, they'll tell you the latter, of course, but their actions, or lack of same, speak so much louder than their words. People have an infinite capacity for rationalization when it comes to refusing to face the threat to America's survival. Deep down, these people are afraid they may be laughed at if they take a stand, or may be denied an invitation to some social climber's cocktail party. Instead of, of getting mad at the insiders, these people actually get angry at those who are trying to save the country by exposing the conspirators. One thing which makes it so hard for some socially minded people to assess the conspiratorial evidence objectively is that the conspirators come from the very highest social strata. They are immensely wealthy, heavily educated and extremely cultured. Many of them have lifelong reputations for philanthropy. Nobody enjoys being put in the positions of accusing prominent people of conspiring to enslave their fellow Americans, but the facts are inescapable. Many business and professional people act particularly vulnerable to the don't jeopardize your social respectability pitch given by those who don't want the conspiracy exposed. The insiders know that if the business and professional community will not take a stand to save the private enterprise system, the socialism for which they intend to control the world will be inevitable. They believe that most business and professional men are too shallow and decadent, too status conscious, too tied up 
in the problems of their jobs and business to worry about what is going on in politics. These men are told that it might be bad for business or jeopardize their government contracts if they take a stand. They have been bribed into silence with their own tax monies. We are hoping that the conspirators have underestimated the courage and patriotism remaining in the American people. We feel that there are a sufficient number of you who are not mesmerized by the television set, who put God, family, and country above social status, who will band together to expose and destroy the conspiracy of the insiders. The philosopher Diogenes scoured the length and breadth of ancient Greece searching for an honest man. We are scouring the length and breadth of America in search of hundreds of thousands of intellectually honest men and women who are willing to investigate facts and come to logical conclusions no matter how unpleasant those conclusions may be.